California. They've issued a warrant for the arrest of 25-year-old Andrew Manuel, alias Richard Diaz, for the theft of a house trailer. Police say Manuel and John Collins, the man arrested last week for the murder of the latest co-ed victim, traveled to California in the trailer in June. When we think of prisons, if we bother to think of them at all, that is, there is a tendency to see them as institutions completely divorced from human society, little worlds of their own. But prisons and their inmates are subject to some of the same stresses and strains as the outside world, as Terry Drinkwater reports from San Quentin State Prison in California. The guards at San Quentin have their own way of describing the mood of the inmates. They call it the climate on the inside, and this summer the climate is hot. One white and two black prisoners have been killed. Fourteen inmates have been stabbed. And even moderate convict leaders concede the situation has sometimes become a race war. It used to be a certain group against another group. You know, the Nazis against the Muslims. But now it's a black face against a white face. And everyone is a target. Now, if you're a black man, uh... It don't make any difference what clique you belong to. As long as you're black, you're going to get hit. If you're a white man, it don't make any difference what's your age or what clique you're going to get hit. Even though San Quentin is a maximum security prison, the inmates are very much influenced by society on the outside and the racial tension that is there. A third of the inmates are black. Many call themselves Panthers or Mau Mau. But white convicts have underground organizations of their own, too. They call themselves Nazis or Ku Klux Klan and many regard the blacks with open contempt. Listen to the voice of one white convict. I see a guy with a natural, and he's talking about black is beautiful, and he's sitting there watching TV, and a white woman comes on, and I hear these remarks that he makes about her, you know, what he would like to do with her, you know. And uh, I see the same old gutter nigger so to say, you know, from the street. But blacks at San Quentin are angry also. One told us that for every black man who is murdered in the prison, two or three white convicts will be killed. And they're going to have to understand that until all of us is dead, you know, if it has to come to that. Warden, what are the, the basic reasons for the, the racial trouble and, and the killings? What, what are the fundamental causes of it? Well, just at this point... Uh, we are reflecting more acutely, probably, the, uh, many of the attitudes and, uh, and uh, prejudices of people on the street. Uh, only in an institution of this kind, the uh, people that we have contained herein are more likely to act out their prejudices rather than to talk them out. And they're more likely to, uh, instead of saying somebody's a no-good nick, they're likely to take up a piece of steel and try to do him in. And... Uh, so we are, in fact, uh, I guess, are reflecting the polarization of the races, which appears to me to be taking place on the outside. There are some other reasons for all attention at San Quentin. Overcrowding, two men living in cells designed originally for just one. Many were transferred to San Quentin after getting into racial trouble elsewhere. But some accuse the prison guards of stirring up the race trouble, of sneaking in narcotics and weapons. The police officers that work here bring their prejudice in from the street. The same guy that brings in dope that will bring in any other thing was the same guy that will bring in knives and supply it with other side and keep this stuff going. If you can live together, you live together. But when you got bulls telling you get this black when it gets down or another bull telling the blacks get this white when you get down, you can't stop nothing. You're talking about guards. I'm talking about guards, yeah, bulls, yeah. Prison officials point out, though, that most of the weapons confiscated from convicts are crude but effective devices improvised within the prison. Yet Warden Lewis Nelson is concerned that some guards might be stirring up trouble with thoughtless remarks and racial slurs. He warned them it could boomerang. I would hope that we don't have anybody on the staff uh, who feel this way, because I pointed out to the third watch, there's this much danger for everybody involved. If this thing blossoms out into a full-blown racial war, if it does, then they're talked that it's they're talked that it will. I've got some letters in here that said you're not going to keep us from it, Warden, no matter how you go. So we're going to get this thing down. We're going to resolve it here. If it comes down to that, remember you are either black or white, as the case may be, and you may be marked for extinction because this war might, might of necessity have to be escalated. Now, in my work, I've seen 10 members of the staff lay with their blood flowing out of them. I don't want to see any more. 
So is a, you know, is a favor to your wife. You ought to, you ought to be circumspect enough in your character so you won't be likely to be a target for this sort of uprising should one occur. In an attempt to ease the racial tension, the warden has met with both black and white prisoners. One of the sessions was bitter. The inmates accusing the warden of depriving them of what used to be routine privileges after the violence had subsided. They felt they were double-crossed. But the warden's prudence seems to have been justified because the incidents continue. Even now, the warden's approach remains moderate. Yet there's no certainty that reason and mediation will work. But the warden feels it has to work. Well, sooner or later, and hopefully sooner, the inmates will come to the realization that they've got to live together. We have had the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazis and the black militants sitting down together and talking. Uh, we have done better than they have in civilization on the outside, I believe. Failing that, we'll have a bloodbath. The bloodbath which Warden Nelson fears is particularly disturbing because of something else he says. He believes his inmates are simply a microcosm of society on the outside. And he feels that what is happening now on the inside of his prison could well point towards even more violence and murder in the streets in the years to come. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, San Quentin. ...has famously been called a cleaner version of hell, and it's where Joe Harsonayev would go if the jury decided to spare his life. In an exclusive interview, a former warden and a former inmate tell us death is easier than life at the federal supermax. The I-team's Warren Lemanchek traveled to Colorado for a closer look. It is as isolated as the prisoners who call it home. The prison, called ADX Florence, is a tomb for the living. To me, it's life after death. Bob Hood was warden at this Supermax prison. He spoke exclusively to the I-team in detail about a prisoner's sparse existence here, two hours south of Denver. For Johar Zarnayev, what's his life in ADX like? Even if the behaviors are good, though, it's pretty much a 23-hour a day in the cell, one hour outside. And even outside, it's not uh, a walk in the park. It's a, a caged environment. Inside the Supermax, Sarnayev would join a notorious group, the Unabomber, Oklahoma City bomber Terry Nichols, and other Islamic terrorists like 9-11 conspirator Zacharias Musawi, Ramzi Youssef, the mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center attack, and Richard Reed. But Hood says Sarnayev would be no match for them or the 400 other hardened criminals here. He'll always have to be in solitary. He's young, he's uh, probably not streetwise, and he's very susceptible to assault, I, I think, because the average inmate would like to hurt him. His life will always be in danger. This is the most secretive prison in America. No one is allowed inside, and the only pictures we have are from federal lawsuits. A prisoner lives in a cell the size of a bathroom. It has a shower, a toilet, a concrete slab covered with a thin mattress. In the rare time outside, prisoners are kept in cages. One 15-minute phone call per month and a small black and white TV may seem like luxuries. But Hood says they're also tools, so the guards have something to take away. It is as stark as stark can be. It was not designed with humanity in mind. The isolation, the solitary, uh, you know, day to day, you're trying to keep your basic humanity from slipping through your fingers. Ray Luke Levasseur of Maine spent five years here after being convicted of bombing public buildings. He says the sensory deprivation can drive a man insane, and lawsuits show it has. You just begin to degrade over time. You feel it. And so, as Sarnayev's lawyers fight to save his life, both the former inmate and the former warden agree he may wish they hadn't. I think it's a false choice in the sense that I think they're both death penalties. What is the worst possible punishment? Their hearts will say, kill him. If they're really looking for revenge and know the system, they should be asking for life imprisonment at the Supermax. The Federal Bureau of Prisons has the final say over where Johar Sarnayev spends his days. People who've been here say the best hope an inmate has is to be sent somewhere else. Reporting in Florence, Colorado, Lauren Lemanchek, WBZ News. What's going on, you guys? Welcome back. Another episode of Green Lit Gang TV here. I uh, appreciate you guys checking out the video, checking out the channel. Today we're going to be covering Barry Mills, the Aryan Brotherhood, and their war uh, with the D.C. Blacks. Um, goes back a lot of years, a lot of decades, a lot of moving parts, a lot of people involved. Uh, super interesting. We're going to give you a little background 
on uh, Barry Mills individual. And I just, I, I kind of made him one of the focal points of the story because he is such a prominent figure in this story and he kind of stands head and shoulders above the rest of them. Uh, Going to go into there and brother a little bit as well as uh, the background on the DC blacks and some of the main characters on their side. So uh, Barry Mills born in Windsor, California on July 7th, 1948. You know, <laughs> basically from the beginning was in trouble. So spent a majority of his teenage years incarcerated, um, obviously spent almost all of his adult life incarcerated. All right. Um, and they talk about with Barry Mills that when he got to prison, when he got to jail, it's almost like he found his calling. He thrived behind bars. He thrived in this setting and in this situation. And it's just super interesting to cover this because prison and all this stuff is meant to reform, right? It's meant to deter you from wanting to go back. Well, in Barry Mills' case and a lot of these other characters' cases, this is where they felt at home. This is where they felt most comfortable. They didn't feel comfortable on the street. You know, They weren't respected. They didn't hold positions of power in, in, in regular population out in the real world. So um, just kind of gives you a little insight to that mindset. Uh, by the age of 19, Barry Mills had stolen a car from a country club, went on the run, uh, hopped on a Greyhound, and uh, was arrested basically when he got off <laughs> of that Greyhound, was sent to a youth reform camp, uh, turns around, quickly escapes from that. After he escapes from that, he planned a robbery with a buddy. Uh, that robbery netted them $775. Now, they end up getting in trouble for that. His partner gets picked up. Rats on Barry Mills. All right. Now, one thing I want you to remember. Barry Mills grew to despise informants, people he considered rats, people he considered working with law enforcement. And Barry Mills would go on to, throughout all of his time incarcerated, all the times he got in trouble, there was always somebody cooperating, always somebody that he at one point, you know, at one time or another had trusted and led into his orbit, into his world, and in his mind had, they had turned his back on him. So just something to keep in mind, all right? Now, he gets put in prison for five years for that robbery that got him $775, gets sent up to San Quentin, all right, where he is eager to ingratiate himself with the Aryan Brotherhood, all right? Now, initially, the Aryan Brotherhood, they first established because they want to protect their own. They want to protect for safety reasons. They want strength in numbers. They're tired of getting attacked. They're tired of getting singled out and beaten up, and they band together to form a, you know, a group and to perform a protective unit that kind of moves as one, right? And Mills sees this and he loves it. Always ready to jump in, commit whatever was needs and further of the gang. He loved the lifestyle, loved everything that prison was, and he thrived in it. He gets released for that first robbery in 1977, but not too long after being released, he's rearrested for planning a bank robbery in Fresno, California. The guys only got – their crew only got $21,000 even though they thought they were going to get $2 million. Now, I, how they only got about 2% of what they thought they were going to get. My math is right on that. I think that's what – yeah, 2% of what they thought they were going to get. Um, I don't know. But an informant once again gets Mills arrested. Now, this time the stakes are a lot higher. Given 20 years and because it's a bank robbery, a uh, federal bank robbery, okay – He's now in the federal system, all right? Barry Mills loved violence. He gets back in with the AB, the Aryan Brotherhood, which he was already with before. And he starts making a name for himself by the level of violence which he was willing to go to, all right? Starts roaming, like I said, climbing, roaming the ranks by not only committing acts of violence, but almost going over the top in the acts of violence he was willing to commit, um, in 1979, he murders John Marsloff over a gambling debt. And he did so in such a public way that everybody could see it. All right. Now, John Marsloff was like an associate of them. At one point, you know, was in with them okay. But like I said, gambling debt got put in the hat, got put in the, uh, you know, the, the no good list. And Barry Mills basically volunteered and said, I'll take care of that. Did that. And he did it in like a day room where everyone's just kind of hanging out watching TV. So. That's the late 70s. Now, as the 80s come into play, this brings on a new era. They aren't just about protecting themselves. It's not just about random acts of violence, okay? Now it's about making money. Now it's about extortion, protection rackets, 
drug dealing, all right? Uh, any kind of, any form of currency, illegal currency, these guys had their hand in it, all right? Now, a commission is also formed, a three-man federal commission. Barry Mills, T.D. Bingham, and Gr- John Greshner all head up that three-man commission, the drug trafficking, the extortion, the protection, it all gets taken to the next level. John Gotti, the former head of the Gambino crime family who got convicted of RICO and goes away for a long time, also gets placed in the federal system, was a shining example of this. John Gotti reached out to the Aryan Brotherhood for protection. At one point, says, I don't need you guys anymore. Thanks, but no thanks. Gotti gets attacked by a black inmate comes running back to the AB and says, hey, I want to have him have him whacked. I want you guys to murder him. The AB takes Gotti's money, never did the hit. They basically told Gotti that, hey, we couldn't get to him, yada, yada. But a lot of people believe that that wasn't the case. They took his money and didn't do it to kind of prove a point that, hey, man, you should have never left it in the first place. This isn't the streets. This isn't New York. You are 100% in our world. Um, so just gives you an idea of the power they're beginning to gain late 80s early 90s and they're beginning to get more organized there's a council formed underneath the commission those guys are to report day-to-day activities back to the federal commission and i don't want to get you know the ab was established in california okay in san quentin now they have the federal level there's also state level leaders i don't want those to get mixed up because if you go online and look you'll see some of the state level pictures of guys um you know, Michael Thompson and some other ones that are on there. The leadership changed over the years. But what we're focusing on is Barry Mills being one of the three commissioned members at the federal level for the Aryan Brotherhood. All right. And the crimes that were committed, the sense in their war with the D.C. blacks. So. Another thing to really remember by the 90s and before that, not just in the 90s, but before that. The AB were very specific about who they let in. They weren't just bring in everybody, okay, and just build up numbers that way and build up strength in numbers. No, they wanted the best of the best, and they got the best of the best. And there was like a blood in, blood out system, right? So you have to commit an act of violence, mainly murder is what my understanding is to get in. And you don't just leave. You you are taken out. You leave in a body bag. You leave in a coffin. Um, and something to remember is, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, they get out of prison and, and basically they're still getting instructed on what to do by people that are still in prison. It's like, why don't you leave? Well, it's not that easy. One, you can get put in a hat and somebody could kill you on the street. And two, a lot of these guys were career criminals. They knew that if they got out and didn't follow orders and they knew if they got out and wanted to go lone wolf and said, you know what, I'm done. I turned it around and by chance go back to prison and have to deal with the consequences of that, they're not going to make it out alive. So they stuck in the gang. They stuck it out. And a lot of them would end up going back to prison. And when they go back, they're still in their good graces. So just kind of something to remember there. Now, race, of course, was always a factor. The Aryan Brotherhood, the whites, certain beliefs, certain ideals. All right. And then you have the D.C. Blacks, a Washington, D.C. based prison gang goes back, you know, the rivalry with the ABs goes back many, many, many decades, all right? Um, The D.C. Blacks originated in the 60s and early 70s, in part because, and this is kind of interesting, I didn't know this, the District of Columbia is a federal district. It's it's not a state. So having no statewide prison system, all the people, all the inmates with, that got sentenced to basically anything over a year or more were placed immediately in the federal system. Well, that wouldn't happen in most states. A lot of times, right? You commit a crime, you go to prison, it's a state-level prison. Well, for the District of Columbia, no, these guys are all going to the feds. So these numbers are escalating in the federal gang from all these guys from one area. And it, almost by accident, like a de facto gang is created. You also add the fact that there was a high crime rate at that time. And, and it became what it became. All right? Um... They racked up their numbers, and they they became a force to be reckoned with, all right? Now, tensions begin to rise over the years. Now, the famous case of Tommy Silverstein, all right? Thomas Silverstein uh, and another fellow AB member, they, they were beefing with a guy, Robert Chappelle, all right? Well, on November 22nd, 1981, they murder Robert Chappelle. 
Thomas Silverstein is kept within the same prison. It is known that he committed the crime. And the BOP, they say, does this, right? They will purposely put people together that they know are enemies and they know will probably try to kill each other. And that was kind of the case with Silverstein and the national leader of the D.C. Blacks, Raymond Cadillac Smith. He came in knowing that Silverstein had killed Robert Chappelle, all right? And once again, those guys start making threats. Raymond Cadillac Smith was, you know, if you hear Tommy, Tommy Silverstein talk in interviews, he says that Cadillac Smith was making it known I will kill you. I'm coming after you. This, this, this. And Silverstein was reciprocating the threats. Well, it's almost like a cold war of sorts, right? Threats are being made, but nobody knows when something or if something's going to jump off. Well, finally it does. September 27th, 1982. Silverstein murders uh, Raymond Cadillac Smith by stabbing him to death. All right. So you have this in the early 80s. This, This beef, these interactions, it carried on over the next part of the decade, all right? There wouldn't be another huge moment until the 90s, all right? The AB were very, very intelligent, and the DC Blacks were very intelligent, right? These guys are locked up for for long periods of time. They have all kinds of unique ways to communicate, Um, and the DC Blacks have their own ways to communicate as well. The ones that I read about, the Aryan Brotherhood, were a little bit more known to the public, uh, using invisible ink with like urine and citrus juice. They used a uh, old alphabet from the 1600s that Sir Francis Bacon used. Um, they were instructed to read books by Machiavelli, uh, The Art of War by Sun, Tzu, uh, by Sun Tzu. You know, keep their minds sharp. You're in this area. They can control your physical. They cannot control your mental. You keep your mind sharp at all times. So tension comes to a head when in 1997, Barry Mills, T.D. Bingham begin. Their series of letters is, is written back and forth. Mills, Bingham, and other leaders. All right. And they're using coded messages. All right. Now, the famous one is Mills writing about a... um being a grandfather all right now the word on the street was if mills wrote i gave birth or i'm now a grandfather to a baby boy that meant the war is on with the dc blacks if it's a baby girl the war is off well the letter came through a baby boy was born and they'd also discovered that invisible ink and invisible urine a note had been passed from mills to bingham and some other guys that basically read war with dc blacks so what ends up happening, all right, the hit took place, a high-ranking member, Big Al, Al Benton, and some underlings, right, some guys beneath them, they attacked and they murdered two, two DC Blacks in their cells, all right? Now, I don't want to make it sound like DC Blacks were just victims and all this, right? They had been doing attacks back, there had been an ongoing decades-long beef, all right? And it said that the DC Blacks had also been trying to put hits on the AB members, the AB just got to him first, all right? And all this info came out in the indictment. And we'll get to that indictment right now. So that's 1997. An indictment comes down in 2002, right? Racking up. So indictment comes down 2002, five years after these murders are committed. Now, one thing to remember, the murders happened in 97, but they had been trying to get to Mills and the AB... Bingham, all these leaders, the DC Blacks, this ongoing war for a long time. And <laughs> the thing is, you got to remember, the prisoners have nothing but time on their hands. So these ingenious ways they were able to communicate, the levels of which they went to to conceal what they were doing was insane. You know, so yeah, the government was able to get to guys like Silverstein and individuals that were committing violent crime, but they wanted to bring down the whole organization. So, Mills, Bingham, a couple other big-time AB members, they end up getting indicted. Multiple murders. Basically, it's a RICO charge, right? Conspiracy to commit murder, extortion, all of these things, all right? Because that's that's what they are now. They are a full-on enterprise. They're, they're not just some low-level prison gang with a bunch of guys killing each other. No, they're a fully functioning corporation. DC Blacks are almost the exact same way. These guys have money out on the streets. They've got hitters out on the streets. They've got members on the streets. So it all kind of comes to a head. Now, initially, the government is obviously looking to put Bingham and especially Mills to death. At the time, it was going to be one of the largest death penalty. I think it was the largest death penalty case ever. 
And what's crazy is these guys are all in federal prisons, okay? So they're all over the country. Mills Bingham, they've got to get flown Con Air style to the courthouse in California. So you can imagine what that would be like. And Mills wears these big dark glasses. And a lot of people don't know this. It's because he was hit in an eye. He was, I don't know if it's stabbed. He was hit in his eye in a fight. So he has an eye problem. That's why he wears those dark glasses in the Google images or the pictures you see on my video. Um, but it just adds more to like his reputation. It just makes him more menacing. And it said that they were shackled down at the feet, the waist, you know, like with these stun belts around him that they tried to get up. And then you got to think about because the prosecution, the prosecution, right? The government, the United, you know, it's the United States of America versus these guys. They had witnesses on both sides. They had witnesses from the DC Black side. They also had witnesses from the AB side. And remember, going back to Mills hating snitches, hating rats. It said that he was just glaring at the guys that he knew that were telling on him. Um, Al Benton ended up turning state's witness said that after he committed the murders, he went back to a cell and had like a freak out, come to God moment, um, basically broke down and just, you know, everything hits the fan. Now, interestingly enough, okay, all of these guys get convicted, but the jury is deadlocked on whether to sentence them to death or not. Now, I really don't know why that is, um, because I feel like if these guys killed civilians or regular people out on the street, with their criminal history and the things that they've done, it wouldn't be that hard to send them, sentence them to death. But maybe because they were killing each other, as messed up as that is to say, the jury couldn't decide. Regardless, they end up just getting life in prison, no parole. And they are basically sent back to ADX Colorado Florence or sent to ADX Colorado Florence um, to serve out the remainder of their sentences, which is life. And that's kind of where we leave off now. Barry Mills did end up dying in 2018, one day after he turned 70 years old. Uh, T.D. Bingham is still alive to this day. Um, still a couple of the old timers, high ranking guys still around. Um, a couple of them still do interviews or still documentaries made. Very interesting. Spans decades, multiple characters. Um, and I really didn't know as much about the D.C. black side. I didn't really know the or or, you know, the origins of that gang. I thought it was really interesting that there wasn't like a state prison at that level. That's why all these guys got pushed into the federal, uh, you know, BOP. So there you guys have it. I appreciate you guys checking out the video. Until next time, take care.